So, um, that's a long title, so I won't repeat it. Uh, it's also a long list of co-authors, so I re won't repeat that either. Um, thank you for still being here, if you are indeed still here. Um, so, I should start out by saying that I had I'd promised myself I would never work on this kind of stuff again. Um, and, and I thought I was, I was completely safe because last year I went to a computational geometry conference. And this all started out, well, actually, maybe I should go back one slide. Okay, so it started out, it, this is also not really about strings, but it started in strings. So I thought I was, I was safe at the computational geometry conference. And then I went and there was a talk about jumbled pattern matching. And they cited string papers. And so naturally I went to them and said, well, can you do what we did? And uh, so before I tell you what we, and, and the answer was yes. Um, so before I tell you sort of what, what they were looking at in computational geometry, I'll tell you what the background in strings was. So, so if you love strings that much, you can still be happy. Okay, so suppose you have a string uh, S over an alphabet of sigma characters. You want to build an index such that later you're given a vector of counts of characters. You can quickly determine whether there is a substring that has the right um, number of each character, right? Okay, uh, so this goes back in our community to like 2004 uh, to at least some of the people are here and there have, there's been sort of a cottage industry in this problem. Lots of the other people are here too. Um, then they started doing indexing. Uh, so in 2009, they showed that you could, give, you could give a linear space index, which would give you constant query time if you were working on binary strings. And then, uh, so the problem was to do more than binary strings, and that was resolved last year by more people who were here, um, which, and, and the problem was to do like subquadratic space and sublinear query time. So that was done. Uh, so we generalized both of those results in the paper, but I'm only going to talk about the binary case, because if you want to know more about the general case, uh, Tomek is right there. Um, and he read our paper, and he sort of said, yes, it makes sense, and he probably remembers it better than I do. Okay, so how does Chikalese and Liptax index work? Well, let's suppose you have the binary string, so the, the intuition is, suppose I know, I'm looking for five, I already know in advance, I only care about five bit substrings. Sorry, when I'm, I'm nervous, I tend to walk around. Uh, I'll try to stay in one place. Okay, so all you need to know is what, uh, how many ones are in the five bit substring with the fewest ones, how many ones are in the five bit substring with the most ones, and then because you consider, so here's the one with the fewest ones, here's the one with the most ones. If you slide a window between those two, the number of ones can only change by one at each position, so you know that, uh, that this substring contains, every th contains substrings with one, two, three, and four copies of one, but the whole thing doesn't contain anything with zero copies or five copies, right? Because it, everything has to be between the min and the max, and all of the values between the min and the max have to occur in some substring. Okay? Uh, so if you store the min and the max for each possible substring length, so there are n of them, and so you're storing like two n words, then you can detect a substring matching a any given query vector. Remember, the vector in this case is only two. Two counts. Uh, so that's for the detection. You can also make it a bit smaller and stuff like that. If you want to do locating, you store uh, S, you store the positions of the min and the max, and you store a data structure supporting fast rank queries on S, and then you can use binary search in the interval between the min and the max to locate such a substring. Okay, I'll keep going. So basically, here are all of the substrings between the min and the max, and notice that the values of ones in them is not monotone, but that doesn't matter, so you just, you sort of choose the middle, and you say, is this the number we're looking for? And if it's not, then it either has to be somewhere here, which you know is got to be between here and the max, or it's got to be somewhere here, which is between the min and the max, so that's how you do the binary search. I'm sure you can figure it out. Uh, clear? Yeah, okay, so I'm in 
Simon likes it. Okay, so at this uh, CCCG, there were people talking about point sets. And basically, they had an online algorithm for multiple colors. And I went to them and said, well, if it's just two colors, can you build an index? Well, actually, I said, OK, if it's more than two colors, can you generalize um, like the, the Warsaw guy's uh, index to handle most colors? And the answer was yes. But I'm just going to talk about two colors. So you have these black and white things, and you want to build an index. So if some, somebody comes to you and tells you the number of black points they want, the number of white points they want, and you want to say if there's an axis-aligned rectangle that contains the right number of black points and white points. So it's just a 2D generalization of the problem. Uh, yeah, OK. So the idea about paths still works. There is sort of, this is the, the number with, OK, minimum number of black points. Here's got the maximum number of black points if I'm looking for five points. And I can slide this red rectangle around, adding a point, then deleting a point, adding a point, deleting a point, such that I always have four points. And so, so there is a path going from the min number of black points to the max number of black points. The question is, how do I find it? How do I search in it? Because you've got lots of rectangles. Uh, so the basic idea is still kind of working, but, but the problem is, how do, you, how do you store this path easily in small space such that you can do quick, fast query time? So remember that, that it's this sliding thing. So I was writing the slides, and I, I, I came up with the name. So you have to think of this as amoeboid motion, right? You, is, you've got the rectangle, and then it shoots out a pseudopod until it gets another point. At which point it's got too many points, so it retracts and leaves a point behind. This works for rectangles. It works for a lot of other shapes. It doesn't work for all shapes. For example, it doesn't work for a donut. Because it turns out for a donut, you can like put the point such that you nail the donut down. And then if it tries to expand and contract, it loses points against it. Anyway, so we have this, I think my co-authors showed that it works for all shapes such that the entire interior is visible from one point. So it's this visibility core or whatever. OK, but amoeboid motion. So just go back to rectangles. You think, OK, you have, oh, you have, you have the laser. OK, you have the start, you have the minimum, you have the maximum. You're going to sort of slide it down. So at each point, you sort of extend it until you get another point, and then you contract it. And you leave the sides alone until here, where it's sort of it's got, it's got down to here. And then you sort of you stretch it left until you get a point. And then you, you shrink it. And you stretch it left until you're, you've got the height right. And then you just do the same thing sliding along. So it turns out you only have to change direction once. So this is a nice, simple, sorry, sorry, OK, standing in one place. Um, so this is a nice, simple path that changes direction once. Or this is another weird case. Oh, rats, I, yeah, I wasn't supposed to show that to the end. Um, but it's not actually incomprehensible. I mean, this is, you, you start here and you sort of contract down, and then you contract up, and then you slide along. Okay? So, amoeboid motion. So now you, you have the, um, you have the, well, you have the starting and ending. And so you know what the path is going to look like. And you just have to be able to sort of binary search in that. How do you do that? Well, it's range queries. This, this we know and love. So you, you store a data structure for three-sided range selection, which uh, is by Brodel et al. Uh, or you could use wavelet trees or something. Um, and you also store a range counting thing just on the black points. And now, sort of to binary search, you say, OK, well, I reduced to rank space. Oh, yeah, I'll say this now. You reduce to rank space, you figure out where you want the front of the thing, of the, the amoeboid rectangle to be, and you know where the sides are, and so you do a three sided range query and you figure out where the back has to be, and then you do a range counting query in there and find out how many. You figure out where the back has to be to know where to get the right number of points, and then you do a range counting query on the number of black points in there. Um, 
And yeah, okay, that was it. Uh, so, you mix all of this stuff together. So the binary search is in rank space, so that's going to take like log n time. And Brodelat-Alls takes like log n, logs, uh, log n over log log n. So the binary search takes all of log square over log log n. So, and everything takes linear space. So you've got given n black and white points in general position. That was on a slide earlier. I don't know if anybody saw what it means. Uh, we can build an O of a, a linear space data structure such that later, given the number of black points and white points in O of log square n over log log n time, we can find an axis aligned rectangle that contains the desired number of black points and white points. Uh, the general position, I forgot to mention it, but it is important. So, so this is apparently a key phrase in the computational geometry community. Uh, th they use this, they, they have weird things, like I found out, no four points co-circular. Uh, co they actually say things like that. Um, so general position just means that the x-coordinates uh, and y-coordinates are unique. So if you put it, if you rank space reduce, and you consider on a grid, all, each row and each column contains exactly one point. Um, this is important because that means when you do your amoeboid motion, when you slide forward, you never hit, sorry, uh, you never hit two points at the same time. So you hit one point and then you slide the back forward and you lose one point. And you slide forward and you get, and, and yeah, that's why this works. That was a key point. I'm glad that it did come up again. And now, so I'm allowed to move, but I just have to move in this plane only. Okay, so forward and backward. Um, okay, now because Simon is in the audience, we talk about construction. <laughs> I was worried, and then I was going through my slides, and I thought, yes, I have this covered. Okay, so how fast... So finding a path is easy. How fast can you find the, the rectangles with minimum points and maximum points? And this gets tricky, possibly, for other shapes. But for rectangles, it's not so bad. So, you, so this idea we sort of semi-copied from the, their earlier computational geometry point. You sort of choose a height. So the height is going to go between 1 and n. And you, you take a slab of that height. This also feels very familiar for some of us from slabs. Slabs have come up. <laughs> OK, so you slide the slab up. Uh, we reduce strength space naturally. We slide a slab up the, of height h while keeping track of the minimum and maximum points of ones in the substring of length l in the binary string obtained by collapsing the slab to one dimension. Okay, so this, you collapse the slab and you've got like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Okay, and it turns out that the height, you say, okay, I'm going to consider rectangles that have that height. So now I know what the upper and lower boundaries of my rectangle are, and so I just have to worry about the left and right, and so basically that squashes everything into one dimension. And that's great, because that justifies you having sat through all of that, because we give something back to strings. We get back to strings, so everybody can, can cheer up. Um, so you were figuring out how to do this because you're sliding this thing up and you're inserting points. So points are dropping out the bottom and coming in the top. And this is like in deleting points and inserting points in a binary string. So it turned out we, could, we actually built a dynamic, um, a dynamic data structure for binary strings, for jumbled pattern matching in binary strings. So we can maintain a dynamic binary string of up to n bits such that inserting and deleting a bit takes O of n log n time. This sounds terrible, but it's not actually that bad, because if we made it a lot better, it would break a lower bound for building the index for binary strings. Um, so if it were like n to the 1 minus epsilon, that would make, that would like improve threesome, or something like that. Um, OK, such so the given L determining the minimum and maximum number of ones in any substring of length L takes a constant time. Corollary, we can build our index for point sets in n cubed log n. Isn't that great? n cubed. Arr. But fortunately, we're working in two dimensions. So apparently, n cubed doesn't phase the computational geometry people at all. Like I was saying, n, n to the 4, n 3, what? This is terrible. And they were like, whatever. 
It's, it's like dimension plus one. Okay, so we get the final theorem. We mix that, those two lemmas, the, the time and space lemma and the construction lemma. Given n black and white points in general position, we can build a linear space data structure such that later given number of black and white points, blah, blah, blah. Uh, same query time. Uh, so we just, yeah, this is actually, I haven't even put the construction time in here. Never mind. Um, okay. But the important thing on this slide, <laughs> it's, yeah, okay, it's just not an important thing in my world. Um, the important thing is, we as a community um, have now looked at jumbled pattern matching in strings, trees, graphs, and point sets. And in all of these, this amoeboid motion on binary stuff works. On strings, you're sliding this window along, which is basically an amoeboid motion. Trees, we had papers last year. Danny, I can mention you here. Um, okay. Uh, that. Sorry? Okay. I'll just. Danny, well, there are two Dannys. Danny Hermelin, I am mentioning you now. Um, okay, so we had, uh, we had trees. We also had. Also, Gabby. Um, and Oren out there somewhere. Um, and we also had, uh, so that was trees and graphs. We also had a paper on trees and graphs last year. And in all of these things, this amoeboid motion works. Um, point sets, the amoeboid motion also works. Matrices, the amoeboid motion breaks. Why? Because you slide like a rectangle in a matrix over one, and a whole load of stuff comes in. That's why the uh, general position is, is important. Uh, so matrices, it would be cool to figure something out. So, so what else can we do? You know, there's, there's, there's this general trick, and it would be nice to figure out what its limits are. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I guess that's the end of the day. Now that the construction has been answered, do we have any other questions? It's not okay. You are being recorded for posterity. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> so, if I understand with my limited understanding, um, usually they, they are happy with general position because they reduce, they can reduce uh, the general case to, uh, you know, no three points collinear. Mm. Can, I guess this is not the case here, but maybe... We, we came up with I mean, you could do things like saying, okay, points, e e if the points are exactly on the perimeter, then we get to include them or exclude them as we choose. Okay. With that, also works. Okay. And, and in fact, yeah, you can also do things where you say the distances between the points are like one, so it's on a grid, but not necessarily general position, but we are allowed to slide the rectangle half a grid unit, because that way if you t t run into two things at once, you can lose something, I think, by sliding half, but that gets really ugly. So I, I like general position, I, I love this phrase. I'm going to include it in all kinds of things from now on. Um, okay. okay. Thanks.